This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with artist Lauren Quinn. Quinn is an abstract painter that builds paintings known for their vibrant colors and layer upon layer of mark making. In the conversation, we discuss her multi-stage process, her pursuit of intense colors, her love of Los Angeles, and the meaning behind the name of her new show at Blum and Poe. And now, a discussion about layers upon layers with artist Lauren Quinn. Lauren Quinn, thank you so much for joining me this week on the Art Sense podcast. Um, Lauren, with artists, I usually like to start with a hypothetical, which is Let's say you're at a dinner party and you're seated next to someone who's never met you. They don't know what you do. They've never seen your work. How do you describe what you do and what it looks like to them? Uh, I mean, at a dinner party, I tend to I tend to be a little shy about um, introducing myself. So I would say I make large scale abstract paintings and kind of start with something really bis- basic. Yeah. Sure. And so then if they are sort of knowledgeable, they'll say, well, what, what do they look like? Do, do they look like Picasso or do they look like, you know, they'll, they'll try to put you in some sort of box. And of course, no one ever wants to be put in a box. So what's the next level of description? Yeah, I say I, um, I use, there's, there's not a lot of forms it's it's slightly biomorphic but I use tubes as the base of the painting and they are colorful and there's a lot of carving and there's a lot of printing involved and there's a lot of layers and um yeah that's what I would that's what I would maybe <laughs> land toward yeah that, that's probably a good place to start in that's layers right because I mean your work is like this abyss of layers. Mm-hmm. You know, it seems like over the past decade, there's been an explosion in the flat aesthetic, you know, lots of painters using lots of tape to, to make flat acrylic surfaces. And, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of goes back to the picture plane, you know, the painting as an object versus the painting as a window. Your work's not flat. It's all about layers and depth. Can you talk about that conscious decision? Yeah, I mean, Oh, there's so many ways to approach this. I think, well, I would, so to explain how it goes down, I would say I start with um, a pattern of small tubes um, that are sort of isolated co- three or four colors. And I cover the canvas with this pattern and, and that kind of creates a general um, kind of oscillating color. And then I put down thicker paint and um, while that, thicker paint is wet I carve into the thicker paint and the small tubes um, are kind of weaving underneath as um, is shown by the carve carving out they're carved mm-hmm. out again but there's but um, the thicker paint is also um, a similar tube it, it shares the the kind of gradation and values so the values of the pattern underneath start to compete with the um, the value of the thicker tube and it kind of it creates um a space that i'm really interested in of everything being competitive but not necessarily am i uh building out space in a illusionistic way um th- th- that's not necessarily the goal the goal is for um everything to be coming at you um and i think it, it works in in sort of understanding value and color in a way that I can um, make things really vibrate forward. You know, as you're describing that process, I was I was thinking of the word vibration, especially, you know, like you say, you have those smaller tubes that with the negative space that's carved away in that process, it winds up, those areas aren't 
always necessarily clean or white. They're usually kind of those lines wind up being kind of striped because of mm-hmm. what what you have under there, right? So there's like this frequency mm-hmm. that's going on, right? That is one fundamental element to it. But the third is that there's always a catalyst on top of that. There's always um, more involved, which is that I also use um, litho ink and I print onto the surface of the of the the carved in uh, lines and um, it's a you know it sits very forward as well but it also picks up the ridges and sort of the t- topography of the work that I've been do- doing in a way that it, it um, starts to glimmer off of these uh, tubes pretty much you know I've read about your process and there, there are parts of your process that I'm just really curious how you know for example mm-hmm. that process with using the litho ink my understanding mm-hmm. is that you work from the back almost making like a contact print right yeah it's a mono print I mean it I yeah the painting is turned over you probably don't have a lot of reference about even what part of the painting you're affecting and you're you're doing this mark making you know, there, there winds up being actual marks on the backside of your painting, right? Yeah, there's there's whole paintings on the back of my painting sometimes. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's really grown over time. It started as trace monotype, which I found was a really um, exciting way to kind of continue my drawing practice, which is just something that is inherent to, to me. I think it's where I started working and it's where I maintain the work still. Um, And so it started as these trace monotypes, which um, I was doing in grad school. And then I started basically integrating it into the painting. Um, And when I was, and all while I'm doing that, every area where the ink stinks, sticks together, or it, um, you know, is too light, those, all of that play becomes part of the work in this sort of um, consumed by it and um, it's also litho ink so it's it's workable as oil paint it's oil based and so it just it it creates this um third space that I contend with and I mean there are drawings on the back and I've gotten so much more comfortable at reading how the painting will develop when mm-hmm. I'm working on it from from the back but I've, I've found new ways to do it as well I've started using sandpaper to print the, the the litho on to apply it the other way, um, I've you know made paintings into giant light boxes and planned it that way. Oh. I, mean, I think there's so many. It's it's really a problem solving exercise in that part of it. I don't ever want to control completely, and I want to embrace and use and learn from it. And the other part is still a game of of, of uh, handling and. Um, it's very exciting. It's like the 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 painting can be uh, very vulnerable at that point. You you obviously have a process now, and you know it's it, your work is kind of tied to what we would call process based art. How did you arrive at your process where where you are now? Was it just a lot of experimentation? Did you just keep on adding on and on, or or did you see certain people doing certain things, or you know, in art history, and just kind of gravitate and grab and choose and and pick from different places? It's really all three. Um, I think that, uh, you know, all of the elements of the work that it is, that it contains today have, um, been kind of bouncing around for the past six years or so, maybe even longer. I think, um, you know, I can, I can pinpoint exact paintings and, um, certain times when it clicked in. I think, um, I've always sort of had a handle on uh, you know, drawing and, and modeling in a, in a way that really evokes the body. And um, so that was always kind of the underbelly of, of what I would draw. And then, um, you know, when I was in school, I was always in, in school, I mean, grad school at Yale, <laughs> I was, uh, I was always kind of struggling to find the painting I wanted to make in that I was, um, carving into the paint in a different way. I would sort of cover a colorful painting 
entirely with white and then I would carve into it like it was a sheet of paper, almost massive. So there was this carving element involved. And then the third element that was also there was um, the tube, which really this tube mark was a game I was playing with myself at the end of grad school because I was looking for form and light and in the process I was pushing everything into gray and so I was, so I was at the art institute, I'm not the art institute, I was at the Yale University Art Gallery and there was a Leger painting that I just loved. I loved the sort of specifically a detail of hands holding a book and the way that it was structured was um, you know, so tight and rhythmic, but also, um, you know, it, it implied so much form that I felt like I needed some structure like that. So I basically took a painting that I considered a failed painting um, in my studio and I just remade it one to one, but with this tube mark and it really clarified color for me to uh, isolate the color combinations into twos and threes, but also keep this sort of modeling and form that I think is sumptuous and interesting. And I was doing that for a long time and then I started printing into it and it was a bit more, um, I'd say for the, for the next year, year and a half, I was, I was using these tubes and using the printing and using the carving, but it was all isolated. You know, like the paintings worked in these zones and it was much more structured. And then um, what really happened is when the shutdown happened, I was maybe half a year out of grad school, really trying to get on my feet in LA. And suddenly all this, this work uh, was only being seen online. And so all the carving that I was doing into the paintings, into the wet paint was much finer. It was kind of with a, with a uh, exacto blade mm -hmm. and the printing, it just disappeared when you, when you shrunk it on an image and, right. and it, um, it really changed the space of the paintings for me and the conversation around the painting started to being, being exclusively about screen spaces. And not that I don't, think about technology and, and sort of the way that these paintings are shared, but it wasn't the angle that I really was um, driven by. So I basically took that tube mark and I enlarged it until it became more of really consuming the painting. And then I started carving into that tube and I made the carving wider as well. I started using a a, a butter knife instead of a and a spoon instead of a exacto blade right and um you know it was really i mean it was really trial by error and and embracing those errors and learning how to build it out painting by painting um but i think that that's maybe a general trajectory of how i've gotten to where i am now Things have gotten bigger, and my, my experience is that that's one of the things you just really have to deal with when you go from something that's maybe a 30 by 40 to something that's 6 feet by 10 feet is that you know all of a sudden the, the marks that you were making uh, all of a sudden become microscopic. And so you kind of have to change the way you mark make, right? I mean, you're, it's the same way, but you know you have to find different tools to make those marks bigger. Actually, no. Okay. <laughs> I... I... I've always sort of, I've always worked fairly large comparatively to maybe um, my cohort. I've always worked on the larger side. Sure. I think I was before, before the last two years, I would say like a six feet by four feet was, was a, a pretty, like a bread and butter type of range or proportion for me. Uh -huh. um, but because I'm, I'm kind of just a tall, like a big person, and I like to spread <laughs> out and use my body and feel feel what that feels like and really dance in, while I'm working. But um, I would say that uh, with the, the painting, you know, there's like a 15-foot painting in the show that I have up at Blum and Poe. And what excites me about making those paintings is because um, the size of the smallest mark contingent to the whole of the painting is still the same. I'm still using that butter knife. Okay. Um, and it's, it really is 
it, and, and the window of time in which the painting dries and is, is workable, all of those things are the exact same. And so it really actually has, um, I, you know, it really taught me about commitment into that window of time that you're working. And, and um, yeah, I think I have um, kept and held, held on to the actual scale of the mark uh, while also um, scaling up in this recent body of work um, because uh, it it's interesting to me to to have the um, success of the painting still hinge on these tools you know tell me about how much planning you do about your painting before you execute it because some painters have it all mapped out in Photoshop, some of the, the most successful painters get it so precise that they just can kind of outsource it. I kind of get the impression that based on your process, that a lot of it is spontaneous or improvised. But, you know, you tell me, how much planning do you do? How much of it is feel? You know, I would say that the planning I do is always um, with the intention of diverting from that plan. Um I like to, when I, especially when I'm starting something, I like to pick the most uh, wrong shape or colors I can manage. And I, and I like it to be a real problem that I have to address immediately. And the less attached I feel to the first layer, the less I like it, the more productive I will be, the more incentivized I am to, to fix that immediately before anybody sees it um, right so i think that that has um you know that has been my outlook on on planning and starting on the first layers on on that structure um but i do i do feel that um there are certain paintings in which i've so i, I would i would first of all i'd put myself squarely in a more intuitive camp versus a, a planner i'm just not that type of painter, but I um, I do think that part of part of being part of working like that is that nothing can be only an accident. Once, if I if I find something, I have to know um, how to repeat it. I have to know how to consume it and fold it into the repertoire. And so paintings sort of become. I'll make one painting and then I'll have to make its inversion. Or I'll do something and I have to know how to do it again. And um, that's how really the language expands. So it's almost as if you have a set of rules. And if you divert, you have to figure out how to create a new rule for moving forward. Is that? Yeah, that, that sounds interesting. I like that. <laughs> I mean, that, that really sounds like instructions. And I, I think it's it's more that I really love the struggle of making the painting and the best paintings are the ones that are never resolved and will, and those will give back to me for years to come, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that um, all of that work that I do in, in that struggle and, and in building these decisions sharpens my ability to make the next one as well. Um, so not every painting is a struggle. Some paintings really just soar through mm -hmm. them, or I can do that um, because of that groundwork. But I think um, they become more and more my own each time, you know? If I was talking to a figurative painter, a, a figurative painter probably has some idea when their, their painting is finished, give or take. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> But for, for you, how do you know? How do you know when you've reached the point where it resonates with you, but there's yeah. still something that's unresolved that adds interest? Is it just in your gut? Um, well, I wouldn't discredit the gut. Um, I think that uh, really it's, it's that I've learned so far up until that point from the previous paintings what i what i want from it um but it's but it's definitely not you know i can do all the moves that i've that i would call a finished painting i can i can print on it i can carve i can paint thicker and 
paint washier zones and the color can be bright and everything could be involved and that does not solve a painting. Um, so those are the slower areas. Those take time and they're contingent on what's in front of me and um, on the logic that I have been sharpening with the with all the paintings before it. When you're working, do you feel like you try to uh, create a point of emphasis somewhere in your painting or do, is part of your process to try to divert that to all places on, on the form that it's a, every, everything has equal weight or is, mm. the, is there emphasis? I think everything does have um, equal emphasis. I would say that I, I, I like to play with weight. I wouldn't say maybe, maybe weight would imply something visual. And I think I, I, I like to say that everything has a competitive edge to it, but really, I mean, I understand that I know it's finished when I, cannot stop looking on, at it, but I have nowhere to fix, <laughs> you know, right. I, I, I start swimming in it. And, um, what's really satisfying is when, um, they finally kind of leave my control and I see somebody else looking at it and the way that they look at it, I know I'm successful if the viewer is looking at it the way that I am looking at it in a certain way. Like, um, I see people taking videos and getting really close to the paintings and I'm, and I'm so satisfied that they see what I see because that's, that's the kind of feedback that is sort of priceless. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, am I answering your question? Yeah, you are. Can we talk about color? Do you have rules that you work with in terms of color? Kind of in general terms, we think of, you know, warm colors coming forward and cool colors receding and that's going to create depth, but maybe we want to play with the the antithesis of that. And do you consciously seek out complementary colors, or are you trying to figure out ways to surprise us with combinations? Definitely the latter. I think that um, I really just don't think that there is any wrong color. I feel that um, I naturally gravitate towards um, reds and sort of vermilion and and kind of thin but potent colors and I've really been um for the past two years really been sort of searching for a blue and a green kind of um, with equal potency mm -hmm. um to the way that I know how to lean on my other kind of color tendencies uh but you know color is such a game and it's it's um i just don't think there's any wrong sometimes i i feel that there aren't enough colors <laughs> just in this in the spectrum I, there's just really not enough it's it's so so limited and and um you know there's just not enough paint to to even like get where i want to find get something i want to find i think uh i'll even i'll tint my gesso with a bit of um fluorescent color because it infects mm. the entire color system that goes on top with um, what, because I'm using all oil. And so it, it has right. this kind of, uh, yeah, really like contagious in a, in an unnatural way of kind of pushing around the, uh, the spectrum of the color on top of it. And I think that can be a really fun game. Um, I think color is really a game that's really balancing and, um, you know, having these isolated marks of the tube and the pattern are really useful and in, in kind of maintaining some type of, uh, like some kind of purity with the paint, but it's not, it's not that it's not mixed in or, 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 you know, that I don't mix the paints. I, I keep in with that. I kind of isolate the combinations and so it keeps the paint um, from moving into gray when using such a wide range. I mean, right. all paintings have all colors you could name, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's really about how one color lends itself to its neighbor and building off of that. But it sounds like something that's really important to you is like the luminosity mm -hmm. of the color instead of 
instead of a color getting getting dark or combinations going to mud, you know, we're, it sounds like you're really right. But you need the mud to find the brightness. It's it's all about um, balance. I think that gray and and kind of you know green gray, warm gray, browns, and 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 those colors are so integral to the the whole. Um, but yes, I think that I like the color to be as competitive as the line work, as competitive as the, you know, the printing and the paint, you know, like the paint itself has to push forward as much as the other elements. If I think about the type of space I'm trying to, trying to create in the painting. I feel like artists approach their work with different energies, you know, like someone that's making a mandala isn't bringing the same energy as someone who's an abstract expressionist, you know, like one's meditative and the other one has like a certain aggression. Where do you think you fall on that spectrum? Hmm. I don't know. I think that, uh, you know, honestly, I really love painting. It, it is uh, where I, you know, more than anywhere else can like locate any type of self-esteem is in what I make. And so I really feel proud and, and happy when I'm painting. I feel excited by them and I'm excited by the problems in them. So I think that um, when I call it dancing, I, th I think less about the action and more about the attitude. Um, and that's pretty optimistic maybe. You know, I look at your bio, very rarely do I see, uh, you know, an artist bio that just crisscrosses the U.S. quite the way you have. So you, you grew up in yes. Atlanta and then you went to uh, the Art Institute mm -hmm. Chicago. Somewhere in between there and Yale, you spent a summer at Skowhegan and then you wound up in L.A., right? So There it's was like... a stint in New York, which is kind of, so I went, I, I was, I was sort of, in Atlanta, I was always craving a bigger city, and I started with Chicago, and I spent a lot of time there. And then as soon as I graduated, I went to New York, and, uh, <laughs> you know, like, I didn't I didn't have a working space. I was also coming off of four years of art school and kind of dealing with that. But um, then I got the chance to, with the job I had, to moved to LA and when I got to LA it really suits I just it immediately fit with me and um, I found the community so much so much faster in a studio and I got so happy and I started making work again and um, I got into in the same summer I got into Skowhegan and grad school so I went to Skowhegan first and then Yale right after and then when I graduated I came back here to LA. I think the reason I feel like it's unusual is because a lot of times those different art schools kind of have tribes where people will kind of gravitate together to, you know, one of those areas, making it to the West Coast that that fast. You know, it seems like most folks coming out of Yale kind of gravitate to, to New York. Did you did you have classmates that wound up? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Most of them did. And um yeah, I think, you know, when you go to enough school, you never feel alone. And in, in most cities, I feel like I have a network. Um, but, uh, yeah, a, a lot of, you know, the, I think that having that New York bend of grad school was really useful um, in that I'm, I have a different angle towards how I think critically about the work than how I um, hear from my peers uh, that have gone to UCLA. Um, but I also think that, and I know for sure, every time I've moved back to LA, my color in a larger sense just bursts open again. And I think that there is something a bit intangible about that, uh, about that aspect. <laughs> Interesting, because I was that was going to be my next question. What what is it about LA that suits your vibe? Is it purely about the light? Because I mean, a lot of artists talk about you know a lot of times in New York, you're always in the half light of one cavern or another. What 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 is it about LA that that suits you? You know, it's the most accessible place in which your time is still your own, and um, people really prioritize like 
balance in their life here. And I think that that's really useful um, for a painter. I think that it's a really hard, really, really hard undertaking to be an artist. And, and I try and make, I try and streamline my life to make that, that part as easy as possible. You know, I need to find sleep and I need to be social and I need the outdoors and I need the light and the air all in order to to make paintings and um I love New York and I don't think that uh, I think it's a trap to compare them so much I just think that um it suits me is this where you're planning roots or do you think you'll you know there will be another stop do you you know are you going to wind up in London or or Honolulu or (laughs) bye um (laughs) Yeah, no, I, I think that it is. I think it really is. I mean, I like to be fairly central and and as, as engaged as I can possibly be with my community. And, um, and you know, to and I think that there's a reason artists flock here because cause it, it's possible to do that and still find space. Um, so, yes, definitely. I'm, I'm looking for something more permanent uh, as far as studios and living spaces down the line here in LA. So you currently have uh, a show up at Bloom and Poe. Tell me about the title. The title of the show is Pul- <laughs> Pul- yeah, I have to ask, right? Because the, the, the title yeah. is P- Pulse, Train, and Howl. It's Pulse, Train, Howl, yes. Um, so the title, you know, it's it's not familiar as a, as a term to people, but uh, it really is kind of blanketing a few ideas that I put into the show. Um, so to explain, a pulse train is a scientific term for uh, snaps of, you know, s- tiny snaps of energy in the nervous system that create messages, that create movement or thoughts. It's a very basic communication. Um, so it's just, it's very small, fundamental um, codes. And I thought about that in reference to the way that I'm both repeating the pattern underneath, the way that I'm repeating the lines and making them sort of oscillate and vibrate, and also in a larger sense, um, the way that abstraction and communication uh, go hand in hand. And so I was really interested in that um, word that is pretty expansive because it's not necessarily used in an art context. Mm -hmm. Um, But the other thing is when I was researching that, I um, found that there's another term which is called pulse train howl and it's a word for wolf packs communicating with each other over large distances by howling so i was really interested in this okay so it's a wave and it's it's kind of calling back in this way and that that was so evocative for me of this um this kind of relationship i have to intuition and to you know, the way that I gather symbols and shapes and kind of fold them into the repertoire of the painting. Um, so the pulse train howl is this, if the pulse train is, is um, kind of the, your feet on the ground, the, the idea of pulse train howl for me was something um, closer to, you know, an, a subconscious, an unconscious, a, um, a kind of, a mysterious element to the paintings that I am still exploring. And then I also just liked the idea of imagining what Pulse Train would be as mm-hmm. it sounds like something imperative. It sounds like time to me. It sounds like time moving ahead of you. And um, so I also thought that in this context, it would have, it would, it would immediately lend itself towards the poetic, although in fact it is, a real word (laughs) right it is a real word (laughs) but i also yeah i want it to be open i don't i don't like things to be too um prescriptive or and i don't want art speak either and i I, it's hard to name things i'd rather unname them but uh, that was what i went with yeah no i mean uh, it's great that it works on so many different levels right it's almost like you're you're calling out to the the other folks in your pack that have a like minded aesthetic, right? You know, mm-hmm. a you know calling all color lovers come come see my show. Right, right. 
Well, I don't know if it totally works because I don't think anybody has really understood what I meant right. as soon as as soon as they read it. Yeah, well, I had uh, to ask. But they enjoyed to hear when I explain it. <laughs> no, <laughs> I think it's, that- it, it's 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 awesome. And and it's it's great that it that it works on so many different levels, right? Mm-hmm. And I had an I had another show named uh Vocal Fry. Um and I also wanted Howl and Vocal Fry to be sort of you know, I wanted Pulse Train Howl to be calling back to the Vocal Fry show, which was also a show of paintings and um, was a more understandable or just a more common phrase in, in L.A., but, um, you know, had a similar type of, uh, you know, goal with the titling of the show. Okay, so Vocal Fry, that's that's where you you push to make a noise to the point that your your vocal cords just don't comply. Is that right? Or... No, so vocal fry is. Um, I probably listened back to this and, and, and feel like I have it myself. But, uh, <laughs> you know, vocal fry is a word that it's a it's a tone of voice that is typical of like a valley girl. It's um, oh. it's kind of dry, eh, like oh my god. Right. It's when you get very low and your voice starts to creak, and it is right. it is a it is a tone. And I was interested in, you know these paintings and abstract paintings having this tone and or or what kind of I was interested in asking what kind of tone they would have I was also interested in also you know coming up coming off of grad school and and thinking about my position as a woman making these I and a woman in LA making these paintings I was interested in sort of um like making fun of that and and using that to my advantage that was one area sort of related to myself, it related to also um, this idea of something frying, uh, related to me the way that I would like the carving to be competitive, if that makes any sense. I yeah. think that um, if you see the the sort of oscillating values of the pattern underneath the carved line in an image, because like I said, the that I started carving wider and what that did in the image, I started carving wider after the shutdown because people were only seeing my paintings on screens. And so in an image, the carved line, when you use enough of them, when you repeat this kind of drawing until it becomes more like space, the carved line makes more a pattern. It basically, the screen can't take all the information. And so it does this really beautiful flickering thing Mm. um, that is, you know, it's a, it's more of a common printmaking term because, you know, if you screen print a certain way, you'll find this moiré pattern. Um, but it also, uh, you know, mimicking that frying is the way that the printmaking, or not the printmaking, the, um, the contact printing, the, the litho ink, the way that mm-hmm. it sits on, on the, the canvas. In certain areas, it looks like bursts of light, looks like that kind of snapping that I was interested in. And then, you know, lastly, <laughs> I keep finding ideas where it sounds like a conspiracy. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but the last thing that I that I was really interested with that moiré pattern, with the frying, the vocal fry, is the moiré pattern itself is this sort of technical failure that alludes to iridescence. And um, iridescence is the sort of the space of, not the space, iridescence is the quality of light that I am most interested in, quality of light and color that I'm most interested in. Um, and it's really one that's based on motion, you know, because it's it's a feather that's red on one side and green on the other, but it's moving so fast that it creates something that is a holy looking, you know, supernatural. And um, I think that working towards that uh, in a static form is really part of the part of the game great that you put that much thought into it or just allow yourself to i mean there, there's a certain point where you know even as a visual artist you start kind of start thinking like a poet have you ever dabbled in poetry dabbled but i i don't know how to measure them i think that i am very inspired by poems and poetry i think that um 
maybe it sounds poetic, but it's it's true. <laughs> uh, I feel I feel like in awe of color and light and the ability for those things to enact in the in my daily life, even when I'm in isolation and the scope of what I can use is very small. Um, I think there's just always something to find there. So the current show, Pulse Train Howl, mm -hmm. and of course mm -hmm. I didn't have the emphasis right earlier because I didn't understand that <laughs> that the pulse train was one thing and the howl was another. I thought it was all. I thought I was putting equal measures, but now I know well, it's pulse train my, howl. My, my musician friend was. I was talking with him and I was like pulse train. I kept saying pulse train for like three weeks. I just kept saying it to people, and then he mentioned and I would explain it and then I would explain pulse train howl, and he. Um, he suggested that phonetically it sounds like um, less like a, a thriller movie, <laughs> you know, less like Die Hard, Pulse Train, <laughs> so, right? Um, and, and and more like something in and of itself, of its own, you know. Sure. So that was part of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I could see the, I can see the movie poster for the Pulse Train. Right. And you know, I could even I, I don't know. I mean, it, actually, you know, Pulse Train, how you. I could imagine there being like a werewolf thriller on a runaway train. It, uh, I we would could... love to see you uh, illustrate that for me. <laughs> don't, don't don't tempt me. I'll I'll try to pull it off. But well, it's funny. It's funny. Whenever I ask my mom to to, to like look at my painting and tell me what she thinks, she always analyzes it in this way. Where she says, "This is your bedroom window as a child, and these were your aspirations," and she sort of like really spelt it out in this linear fashion um well i mean but that's you know that's part of the beauty of abstraction right like yeah associating yeah sure i mean i i read this book i have it, i'm pulling it off my shelf it's called uh reductionism in art and brain science by this nobel prize winning uh brain scientist named eric candle and in there they did all this brain research about what what's going on when our brain is looking at art and one of the things they found was the more abstract the less a piece makes sense the more we have synapses firing all over our brain because mm -hmm. our brain is trying to fit oh, what we see. yeah, we yeah. our brain's trying to fit these things into boxes and if we can't figure out what box to put the image in our brain just kind of goes into to overdrive in terms of stimuli. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, I think it's natural that your mom looks at your work and starts trying to piece together. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And so, so to her that they all look like Georgia. Right. They, they all look like Georgia. To her. No, I, I think, I mean, I, I also think that, uh, the, the responsibility of the painting and of reading the painting and of, of making the painting, there's just no wrong way to look at an abstract painting as long as you're looking. I think that um, sometimes I, I notice the the way that some people will kind of bristle or push back and say, I don't know, I don't, I'm not a part of this. And I and I and I I always try and encourage the fact that it's, you know, you're not you would never do anything wrong by looking at this. Everything you see is in within my control and everything you want to see is within my control as well. So I just think that um, there's a way of reading that sort of transcends um, typical academia and, and it, is, it is inherent, it is kind of also intuitive and that's, that's also a viewing space for them, you know? Absolutely. So Pulse Train Howl is mm -hmm. up at Blum and Poe in LA through the 25th. So we, we still have like another three weeks when people can go by and, and see, yeah. see that work after that. What, what's on the horizon? Do you, uh, do you have anything big? Oh yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm doing a show at uh, the pond society in Shanghai, which is going to open in September. I think it's opening the day before my 30th birthday. Wow. Um, I know. I don't know if I'll be able to go though. Cause, it's, Shanghai is a little, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's been a little bit of ru rough time in Shanghai lately, right? Absolutely. And, and I'm, I think I have so much, um, tolerance to just, to just, I, it's, it's, it will be what it will be, but it's, I'm making the work regardless. Um, and so that's what I'm working on right now. I'm also, uh, doing 
at an installation at the new ICA San Francisco in the fall, I think around November. Um, and then the third thing I'm doing is that I am doing a solo show at the Nerman Museum in Kansas. And um, kind of tying a bow on all of that is that I'm making a book. And the book will be about all of this work, about Pulse Train Howl onwards, really more like Vocal Fry onwards. Um, and that's happening right now as I'm building out these shows because, um, you know, I really feel like this is one project and it's it's hard to to hem it in with each show in this way that each show has a thesis. I don't think I work like that. I think it's really one larger project. So um, the book I'm really excited for. Sure. That's one more byline we can add to your bio is, you know, <laughs> uh author and uh so how much writing will you contribute or is it is it really about compiling your visuals and, and inviting you know other people to to write essays are, are you even far enough into the process to really have that figured out yet i think we're just gonna do i, I think we're gonna do an interview an essay and just really the work itself um, that's what I have so far. I don't. I wasn't planning on writing something for it. I think the paintings um, will take most of the right. <laughs> take up most of the book. Um, so that's what I have. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Lauren, I I can't say thank you enough for for taking thank time you. out of your afternoon you know, to meet with me to talk about your uh, your past and your present and your future and talk about pulse trains and learn about vocal fries i'm i am i'm leaving knowing a little bit more than i did before and Good. uh and so i really appreciate your time thank you so much that's all the time we have for this week you've been listening to art sense you can find the show on apple podcasts itunes Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. And if you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read the transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening.